Today, uh, our asset managers at utilities and industrial customers and so forth have lots of challenges. We're trying to uh, manage a grid that is, is uh, you know, we're dealing with global warming, uh, recovery from COVID, uh, as uh, the prior presenter talked about, having qualified employees is, is a difficult thing to uh, uh, come by these days. And you want to definitely make sure that uh, people are working safely and doing the right things uh, when it comes to uh, working around electrical equipment. Uh, so with severe weather events, uh, carbon neutral goals. So uh, one of the things that I know uh, I've talking to different utilities, uh, a lot of utility folks are installing uh, backup generation at their houses because they know as all these big coal plants shut down and, and these big rocks that are keeping the system stable are going away, uh, there's definitely concerns about uh, system stability and and now we're we're uh, running power in from lots of remote areas uh, where wind and solar are located, and and so uh, you know we're all charged with ensuring uh, the reliable electric grid. Uh, then, in in addition to the the generation uh, issues with uh, adding lots of distributed generation, wind, solar, so forth. Uh, we're also adding a lot of electric vehicle loads. So uh, I saw a presentation recently that talked uh, about in California where they're adding a thousand electric vehicles a day. And so uh, those kind of things certainly are putting a lot more stress on the grid than uh, we've had in the past, especially at the distribution level where, uh, you know, most people have focused their efforts on ensuring reliability at the transmission level. Uh, but as we move forward, there's a lot more emphasis on ensuring reliability at the distribution level. So, uh, of course, the reliability or the renewable energy. And uh, so, uh, and as again, as the prior presenter talked about the uh, supply chain issues. So uh, how long will it take to get you a transformer? And so uh, no matter how much help we need, uh, we're all here to help. And uh, we we want to, you know, one way or another, we got to make sure that the lights stay on. So go to the next one. There we go. So today's transformer challenges. Uh, so today what we're seeing is, uh, depending on the size of your transformer, one to three year lead times, two to three times the prices. Uh, aging transformer fleets, and so one of the things that Tony knows a lot about is statistics on uh, transformer uh, uh, reliability and so uh, transformer failures and so forth, and so Doble has a lot of good information on that. And uh, But the question that, uh, that we'd like to pose is how much does age really matter? And so Tony's got some good information we'll go through here in a little bit. Uh, and again, additional load from electric vehicles. Uh, we're hearing from customers that the inverters on the solar panels are creating harmonics that are causing transformer issues, including failure. And so uh, there's a lot of questions about how well will the residential transformers uh, that uh, or in your neighborhoods and so forth, how are they going to survive the solar panels and the EV charging and and what effect uh, are these things going to have on those devices that uh, weren't really designed for those uh, loads and so forth. And so uh, the harmonics and uh, so forth at the larger solar farms, uh, we're also seeing issues with the transformers. So, uh, you know, what effect uh, do all the new devices being added to the grid have on the existing equipment out there to supply the power and keep the lights on? And so, Tony, you want to talk about this one or? I'll let you start on that one. It's one okay. of your favorites. Okay. So, 
this graph uh, is actually what inspired me to uh, want to put together this presentation. And and as I was putting it together, I knew Tony had some good information. So uh, that's uh, I asked Tony to join me, and and uh, he provided a lot of good uh, information. So the what we if you look at data on uh, how long your transformers are going to last. Uh, a lot depends on uh, you know where you're getting your transformers from, the specs that are used, so forth. Uh, and there's not really a whole lot of data out there that is available on a broad basis to show, uh, in general, how long your transformers are going to last. Uh, when I was involved with the uh, IEEE C57104 uh, 2019 uh, IEEE guide for uh, uh, DGA and mineral oil transformers. They uh, surveyed or they they had data from about 1.4 million oil samples from over 300,000 transformers. And so this is the largest data set that uh, I'm aware of. Uh, and maybe Tony Double has more. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. But yes, we do. Oh, okay. So Double does have more. So uh, again, why I had Tony on. So, uh, but the interesting thing is if you look at out of the 300,000 transformers that were in the IEEE data set, uh, <clears throat> you notice that most of the DGA samples are being performed on transformers that are in the five to 20 year range. And after the 20 year point, uh, you start seeing a fairly rapid drop in the amount of sa samples available from transformers that are 20 years and older. And so as you get out to 30 and 40 years, the trend continues down. And once you get out to about 60 years, uh, there's very few transformers uh, that are being sampled, uh, at least that, that were in this data set, that are above uh, the age of 60. So Tony, of course, uh, has some good knowledge of uh, he was telling me about a trans some transformers that he's aware of that are over 100 years old that are uh, still in good shape. But uh, for the most part, uh, you know, this provides some some valuable data. Uh, but it, as uh, with any data, it's open to, to interpretation. And so, uh, again, Tony can talk some more about the statistics before we move on. Tony, did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. So this is an interesting chart in that it doesn't tell you anything about how many have failed. It only tells you the age of a unit in service. It doesn't tell you how long it lasted after that. It doesn't tell you if we've had 100 samples taken from a transformer. It just gives you an indication that there are fewer samples from older transformers. Therefore, older transformers are less likely to occur, um, which is what pretty much you'd expect. But the question is, why are there fewer transformers which are older? Some will have been removed from service, some will have failed in service, some will have been um, exchanged for larger transformers due for load reasons, etc. So we need to know why. And this graph doesn't tell us that. It just says there are more samples from younger transformers than older. Okay. Need a bit more to it to get that information. I would like to go back to something Mosse said about qualified workers. And it is relevant here that to take a good oil sample to generate data to assess the condition of your transformer and then make a decision about that transformer needs someone who knows what they're doing to take a sample. And not only are they qualified to be on the site, not only are they qualified to take a sample, but when they take a sample or they run an SFRA test or they run a PD test, can they recognize data which is acceptable? Irrespective of how you interpret it, can you actually recognize that you've made a good reading before you try and work out what the reading means? And that to me is what a qualified worker is. They can identify an SFRA trace and say, yeah, it's what we'd expect. Now we'll try and interpret it. So just as an aside, thank you mostly for pointing that out. Okay, so uh, in search of more data on, on transformer life expectancy, uh, Tony also pointed me to the uh, C-grade transformer reliability study from 2015, which I found interesting. It's a C-grade report, C-grade uh, primarily Europe, uh, and this data set is uh, includes over 7,000 transformers from North America. 
And so <laughs> uh, I, I question why Seagrid doesn't have wonderful, lots of thousands of data points from transformers in Europe. But in any case, uh, this is information that's publicly available. And so uh, we wanted to include it in here. And I found it interesting that the, the graph actually ends at 65 and it doesn't show anything uh, over 65. And again, going back to Tony's point, uh, how many of these transformers failed in service versus how many were removed from service for various reasons. And so uh, I, I went online and I found a couple pictures of, uh, of transformers on the left. There's, uh, I'm guessing that these are similar applications, similar sizes. I don't have any real information on them, but looking at the picture, uh, you might think that the transformer on the left is uh, what you'd rather have on your system. It looks nice and new and uh, pretty colors on the uh, bushings and so forth. Uh, and then you got the transformer on the right. So if you had that transformer on your right on your system, uh, would you be inclined to replace it just because of the way it looks? And as Mo said, the, uh, the presence of rust is, is not a good thing. But the real question is, is if you analyze the health of these two transformers and you understand the design practices and manufacturing practices of when these were built, uh, we go back to the question of does age matter as, or is age a significant factor? And today's transformers are uh, built a lot different than they were 50, 60 years ago. And so the real question in my mind is which one of these is really gonna last longer? And so uh, again, looking at the transformer health and understanding, you know, based on uh, testing and, and, you know, ensuring that you're uh, looking at the right things on your transformers to understand, you know, uh, what's the real health and is there a need to change it out or not? Yeah, if I could add something to that, Bill. Sorry, Leon. <laughs> so to me this is a useful chart but again it's not the full story in that what we're looking at is a chart of the survivors and we're looking at how old they are but we don't know what life they've seen we don't know how many faults they've seen we don't know what whether they've been supplied in is it northeast wet is it southeast wet with lightning is it west coast wet with high temperatures is it from another part of the world. What we do know is the age. Now things, as far as I know, don't fail just because of their age. They fail because there are failure modes which exhibit themselves over time. And that time is going to be the age of the unit. For example, the number of through faults that we see on a transformer will increase not because the transformer is old, but because it's old and is in a particular area. The degradation of paper, which is a one-way process, that will result uh, from temperature, from oxygen, from moisture. Those three things will act upon the paper over time. So the time by itself needs something to make the transformer deteriorate, and we call it aging, even though the age itself is not an indicator whether the transformer is in good or bad condition. Uh, external rust, as you might see on the right-hand side, is definitely not a good thing, but it's far better than internal rust, which you sometimes see on transformers. And one of the questions I sometimes ask is that if I have a transformer which is one year old, looks a bit like the one on the left on the picture, and I have one which is 50 years old, looks a bit like the one on the right, and when I do a full assessment, they're in the same condition, if I had to choose one, which would I keep? And I would always say choose the 50-year-old one because it's only going to get worse over another 50 years, whereas the first one is going to deteriorate over one more year. So after one year, it's lost a certain amount of its capability, whereas the other one took 50 years to get to the same point. So we have to be very careful about how we use age as an indicator of a problem. It's a, usually an indicator of a failure mode which acts over time. I'll stop there. Thank you, Tony. And so... Uh... I can take this one. Actually, like, you know. yeah, I'll have you uh, talk to this one as well. <laughs> so this is taken from an ISO standard, ISO 18095, which looks at power transformer, the components and the failure modes. And the failure modes are really 
distributed into four counts. There's dielectric faults where the insulation can no longer take the voltage. There are thermal faults where the system can no longer take the current and dissipate the, the associated heat. Mechanical faults, quite often due to lots of inrush current where we weren't expecting that, lots of through faults which shake things up inside the transformer, loosen things, which make it a lot more difficult for the transformer to survive further mechanical input. And then things from external causes, lightning and so on. So there are four different types of source of failures on transformers, but we have to be careful because just looking at what failed um, doesn't tell us necessarily how it failed or why it failed. And on the right, we have some insurance company statistics, and we can see from that that quite a lot of these sources of failure are outside the transformer. Lightning, for example, it doesn't go into great detail, but the paper from Bill Bartley is useful. And if anyone's interested in a copy, let me know. The interesting thing now is that the different failure types uh, are going to be affected by how well the transformer has been kept, maintained, how well it has been looked after. It's a classic thing. I had a, a Ford Focus car for 10 years. It worked just fine. I gave it to a significant other of mine. Six months later, I needed a new car. Now, there was no difference in the roads it was on, but the way it was driven, how it was driven, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, we need a new vehicle. So we've got to be very careful. It's not just who made it, when they made it, what life has it seen, but what life is it going to get in the future as well? What's it going to be subject to? And we are going to be subject to faults. We are going to be subject to deterioration. And it's how we detect those and manage them, which is important. Thanks, Leo. Thank you, Tony. And so, uh, well, Tony, I'll let you talk to this one too, because Tony, uh, uh, I, for for years, I've heard about the bathtub curve, and I've talked uh, to customers about it. And uh, based on information available in the industry, the life of a transformer is thought to, uh, or the reliability, the failure rates of transformers are thought to be uh, basically a bathtub curve. And so Tony kind of enlightened me to the various uh, other things that uh, Nolan and Heap had. Uh, put forth, and so I'll let Tony talk to this. Yeah, so in the 70s, Nolan and Heap worked at United Airlines. They produced a seminal paper on reliability, and they produced the whole concept of reliability-centered maintenance, which really needs to have behind it an analysis of why things fail, how they fail, and what kind of uh, failure rates you would expect to see. Do you have on the left hand side of the chart now each of these six charts shows time along the x axis and on the vertical we're looking at likely failure rates so the higher up the higher the failure rates are more likely to be and so the bathtub curve is the famous one you have infant mortality you go along with a random failure rate and then you have a rise at a certain point in time um, there's a wear out one and they identified six different i won't go into the great detail here it's one where there's no the random where there's no initial infant mortality and there's no end of life, it's just random failure throughout. And they then worked out how many different asset types were governed by each of these things. Now, admittedly, they were working in the airline industry, different components to what we're used to. But in addition, we've seen this applied um, analysis done in medical industry, in the electric supply industry, in the mining, in oil rigs, and it's generally the same frequency that the bathtub curve only applies to about 4% of asset types. And if you reference back to the Seagrade paper, the Seagrade, not paper, the Seagrade technical brochure Leon mentioned earlier, within that they've got failures, not just from the 7,500 uh, examples from the US, the 1,000 transformers, but we've got from more than a dozen different countries, thousands and thousands of transformers. And when you looked in total, there was no indication of a bathtub type curve. What is far more likely is to get the infant mortality and then random failures with a possibly you can see a fatigue element to it and so i look at the data but we've got to be very careful how we apply these because normally people will say well, what i find is people remember the bathtub curve and they apply it without reference to reality um, i'll come back to that one in a moment because there are quite a few places where we've done this and there isn't a far end to the bathtub and it is quite possible that by the time you get to where the, you think that bathtub is going to start, the population you're interested in has uh, disappeared because they've all failed for random means. So, 
Does that cover that, Leon? Yep. And then you get the next one too here. So this is something I worked on with a colleague at uh, Global Engineering, uh, Dr. Hernandez, Ronald Hernandez. He's done a lot of work on a huge database of transformers and failures that we've looked at over the years. And what he did was he looked at individual companies, individual failure rates, how they changed year by year, decade by decade. So what I did was try and do a summary and say for all the transformers that were built in our database from 1950 to 1959, what proportion of those failed in the first 10 years? What proportion failed in the next 10 years? What proportion failed in the 10 years after that? And so there's a light blue line towards the bottom of the chart. And you can see for those, there isn't much of an infant mortality, but over decades, there is a rise in that failure rate and it's still rising when you get to 40 plus years old. So for the next decade in orange, a little bit further up, we can see the transformers from 1960 to 69 vintage. And we can see that in the first 10 years, there is a failure rate of about 1% then that rises so that in the next 10 years it's higher and then rises again, as if that blue line has been moved to the left. Then you get to the 1970s, the gray line. And again, it's that rise in the first 10 years, next 10 years and so on. And so what we're seeing is that the unreliability seems to be coming in earlier. And this has got nothing to do with individual manufacturers. It's got nothing to do with individual designs. This was just a general population. And a general thing to note is that those transformers built in the 50s seem to last a lot longer before they had some significant unreliability. Again, you move into the 80s, you move into the 90s, and that initial peak is getting sooner and sooner. But take it for what it's worth that these are population, the statistics are for the population. And as ever, we always have to remember the statistics apply to the population and not the individual. So if I have a transformer from 1985, say, to work out what condition it's in, I have to go and look at that individual transformer. I have to go test and assess, gather the data, make decision, analyze, work out what failure modes may be in operation, and then work out what the urgency of my intervention might be and how long I think this unit has. Uh, likewise, if I have one from uh, 1990 to 1999, I may expect the population to show that some of them will likely fail sooner, but to find out about, about an individual unit, I need to look at that individual unit. And that to me is the important message. Statistics are applying to the population not to the individual. And as far as the car on the right, the DeLorean, who wants to return to the 1950s? Certainly not me, because I recall that there were awful lot of things that went wrong in the 1950s that just weren't very nice. And we probably couldn't afford a transformer uh, today if it was built like it was back in the 50s, since uh, generally they were uh, much, much larger. <laughs> yeah much larger but probably still alive now and working <laughs> exactly exactly so one of the things uh one of the big factors in transformer uh, reliability is design changes so as we have moved to to a world of computer-aided design and and the world of using slide rules as far as i know maybe tony still uses one but uh as far as I know, <laughs> uh, I, I was aware of slide rules when I went through engineering school, but uh, I never you know, learned how to use one. So, uh, but what we do know is, is I spent 10 years in substation design, and I know when I was buying transformers in the 90s and replacing uh, transformers, uh, failed transformers when, when I worked at the utility, uh, most of the new transformers were roughly half the size for the same rating as a transformer that uh, it was replacing. And so we really didn't have an issue. The foundation was just fine to hold a transformer half the size. And so we never had to uh, enlarge the foundation as long as we didn't, we weren't uh, actually significantly increasing the rating. And so the, the graph here shows uh, how designs have changed uh, significantly over the years. And I'm not sure uh, uh, this actually came from a uh, information from Herman Vogel at TJH2B, so another 
reference to TJ. Uh, so I didn't reach out to Herman to find out uh, where this came from, but uh, I found it very interesting to see uh, in the early 1900s when, uh, you know, uh, we were starting to build out grids and so forth, uh, very extremely conservative designs. And as uh, things progressed, uh, designs changed year over year after year. Uh, we saw the amount of oil uh, per li or per kV reduce significantly, and so uh, the uh, amount of oil today that's in a transformer compared to the amount that was even in the 60s or 70s is significantly less. Uh, so it it makes sense that we're going to see transformers, you know, since they're smaller, uh, tighter clearances, more partial discharge, more. Uh, more susceptibility to manufacturing issues. So a manufacturing issue that may have not been a problem in the 1950s or 60s uh, can cause a transformer failure very quickly today. And so, uh, and maybe Tony has some, some data on infant mortality, but my feel is that, uh, you know, I was working with a utility that had installed a transformer uh, or was replacing transformers, their 60 year old transformers, because they were worried that they were going to be failing. And uh, the new transformers, uh, some of them failed on startup. <laughs> and so you have to question, you know, how long would those uh, old transformers have lasted if they would have left them in service? And so uh, I happened to be working with a customer, oh, probably 10, 12 years ago that had a transformer failure at a power plant. Uh, the picture on the right is a transformer that uh, was an auxiliary transformer at a power plant. And prior to its failure had no, uh, no history of problems. And you can see uh, the point of me putting it on this slide is this was a 1970s vintage transformer. You can see how small the windings were in that transformer for how big the tank is. And so, of course, today's designs uh, wouldn't you wouldn't have near that much space. Uh, but the <clears throat> story behind this transformer was uh, apparently they had some large motors that needed two transformers to start up, and one transformer was out of service. So uh, they found out the hard way that yep, you really can't start the big motor with one transformer. So. Uh, I uh, had never seen a transformer uh, open up the tank like a door, <laughs> so I uh, found that to be a very interesting case there. And then I'll let Tony talk about the complexities of some of the transformers today on the picture down below. Yeah. So just on the quantity of oil per kVA, not that the chart is not about voltage, but about the load going through the transformer, and the load will generate heat. So what the chart is telling us that the amount of heat generated is being cooled by less and less oil over time, which means it's going to have to be more efficiently used if we wish to dissipate heat like we used to. And that's one of the reasons why the famous uh, Westinghouse 7 million series had problems is that forcing oil through the transformer is the 1970s design, which they made uh, smaller, but the oil got forced through the transformer and would pick up static charge as it flowed. And the 7 million series was famous for what's called static electrification. A bit like having a Van de Graaff, the oil would go through, it would go fast through some parts, it would pick up charge, it would deposit elsewhere, it would build up, then it would discharge and eat away the insulation. So we've got to be careful that we understand the chart as it relates to the cooling of the oil and the ability of the transformer to cool. Transformer at the bottom in the middle, that's the guts of a transformer after it had been taken away from site after it had failed. It was very difficult to inspect internally, but you can see the three main windings off to the left and on the right, we've got what's called the preventative auto, which helps regulate the voltage on the tap changer. And within that preventative auto, a joint, a braze joint had come apart and that led to huge amounts of heat generated at the poor joint. And we had temperatures on the tank next to that in excess of 200 degrees C. That was a transformer we tested here ad nauseam to call Leon from earlier. And we got lots of information, said we can't fix it on site, take it back, they fixed it, put it back in service and away they went. So they are complex items. And looking at the size of that transformer, if you drop a small, small piece of 
copper, just a small piece of a penny, into that transformer, you can kill it without any problem at all because it, there are certain places where it can go and it will just cause problems with the electric fields. So they are extremely strong under pressure, but they're extremely, um, what's the best word for it, susceptible to problems as well. Delicate yeah, situation, right? Delicate, yeah. Take care of them. I must admit, I did feel a little wary earlier because Mose was talking about how often you should um, maintain transformers. And when I was at National Grid US, we said maintenance would, should occur at least once every 12 years. That's when maintenance becomes due. And it's not overdue until it becomes 15 years. So you've got a three year gap to do your maintenance and once every 12 years for us was adequate, mainly for the transmission side. Okay, so uh, what are some of the maintenance strategies that people employ? And, and so we've already been talking about a number of different things today. And uh, I thought it appropriate based on Tony's comments about uh, how uh, you know, what kind of life has that transformer seen? So uh, I, I picked a fairly reliable, uh, well-respected car, a Subaru, and, you know, uh, yeah, would you rather have the one on top or the one on bottom? You know, the, the of course, the, the Subaru on bottom uh, uh, isn't doing so well. And so your transformers are the same thing. Uh, if if you're not treating your transformers properly, if you're not maintaining them, if you're not uh, uh, keeping the protection from letting the transformer see through faults, uh, the more through faults and especially the more significant through faults that they see, the, the less life you're likely to see from that transformer. So uh, as Tony pointed out, through faults are uh, a big issue and protecting your transformer from through faults is very important. And so that goes back to, again, Moses' presentation about uh, making sure your protection schemes, your relaying and so forth are properly maintained. So uh, what a lot of people like to do from a maintenance strategy is the do nothing strategy. You know, there's lots of people that see transformers out there as a big gray box. And as long as it hums, keeps humming, there's no issues. And, and so they really do not understand the complexities involved in uh, that piece of equipment. And uh, there's usually a lot of other things that are going on. So if you work for utility, you know, there's trees to be trimmed, there's uh, lines to be built, there's storms coming through. And so uh, again, if, if the transformer is not exhibiting issues, uh, significant issues, then uh, a lot of people uh, kind of forget about them. And so uh, being such a, a critical component and one that's uh, certainly harder to get, uh, going back to Moses' presentation again, uh, online monitoring is, is a great uh, strategy to employ to uh, have the transformer let you know when there's a problem. And so hopefully you can fix that problem before the transformer fails. And so uh, what's very popular, as Mose also indicated, was that uh, periodic insulating fluid samples. So uh, we've moved away from the term oil sample as we move into alternative fluids, the, the esters and so forth. Uh, and so now we're uh, calling them insulating fluids. And so taking those fluid samples and uh, typically people are taking those once a year, probably on average, uh, Critical units, a lot of people will sample quarterly, uh, non-critical units. Uh, Tony, uh, what's what, what do you guys see at the Doble Lab uh, as far as typical oil sample times? Uh, it depends usually on the MVA of the transformer and anything which is considered uh, 10 MVA or above would usually be annual. Um, some places we went up to 50 MVA and higher and they would be annual or two yearly. So it depends on the individual organization and how risk averse they are and how well they understand the uh, oil sampling process. Right, and uh, we were talking to somebody at a conference recently that was saying uh, at least their labs, they're li uh, currently looking at 30 to 90 day lead times to get analysis back. And so in some of their, uh, they've got, uh, this customer had uh, uh, some, some 
uh, high uh, industrial lighting loads that had, were generating lots of harmonics and and failing like two MBA transformers uh, after a couple of years and so forth. So uh, they said in some cases they've seen where uh, otherwise uh, last year's sample looked fine. They took an oil sample and before the sample came back this year, the transformer had already failed. And so uh, these, these are typically that's not going to occur, but uh, it's a concern when uh, they they actually indicated that when you when they tried to rush a sample at one of their labs, they uh, it's a transformer service company and they said they used several labs. Uh, it still took like 30 days to get a rush sample back. So I'm not sure if people are just taking more samples today, if it's harder to, uh, if labs are dealing with uh, various things, but uh, these are certain, certainly today, again, getting qualified employees and, and getting the job done, uh, it's, it's more difficult to do than it was a few years ago. Uh, so again, online monitoring, uh, people deploy all kinds of different monitoring, single or multi-gas DGA monitors, uh, uh, monitoring your current voltage harmonics, bushing monitoring, partial discharge monitoring, LTC monitoring. So there's lots and lots of monitoring uh, available today. Uh, and as uh, Moz has pointed out, the it's very important that you not only maintain your transformers, you also maintain your monitoring systems and that uh, if the monitoring system is telling you there's a problem, you need to uh, do further analysis to understand what's going on. And do you have any more to add to that, Tony? A few little things, if I may. Sure. Uh, three main reasons, I used to say two, but the three main reasons people apply condition monitoring. I always used to say one was to learn about the asset whichever one it is, breaker, transformer, cable. Uh, two was to learn about the monitor and what it can do for you. And the third reason I put in these days is because people apply it and then don't benefit because the organization is not ready for it. So the third reason to apply it is to work out whether your organization can actually manage it. And related to that is feedback. Usually I quote a guy called Don Schubert, Marsh Insurance, but I've heard similar from um, HSB, from... FM and um, that condition monitoring is a symptom of good asset management. People who apply condition monitoring with forethought as part of a process where they've got re action plans all set up, they tend to be good at the asset management and they use it to support the job they do. If you just apply condition monitoring, that doesn't make you a good asset manager. That just makes you someone who's applied condition monitoring and it isn't necessarily going to help. So those would be related to that. Then comes the whole approach of online monitoring, whether you're looking to do detection or diagnostics. And as you could well imagine, there's a cost differential. And it is sensible to work out why you're doing the monitoring to start with. And don't expect to put lots of condition monitoring on and suddenly be able to do everything. You need to be thinking about how the organization responds. Right? I think I should stop there, otherwise I'll talk too much. Yeah, you, you actually stirred a couple uh, thoughts in my head there, Tony. So uh, one of the things that uh, it, you know, I've been doing online monitoring uh, different types for the last 15 years or so, and one of the things that uh, online monitoring has has uh, told some customers is that they uh, have problems that they weren't aware of and they're not prepared to deal with. And so uh, that's another thing that you need to be considered is, is the, uh, the level of commitment the organization has to actually do something about it when you identify a problem. And uh, so, of course, some organizations, that's harder than others. Uh, and it goes a lot to what Tony was saying about the, the sentiment in the organization, you know, and uh, what, what people are uh prepared to do uh in the event that the monitoring identifies an issue and so uh you know uh, again assessing those risks and so forth uh people usually go back to the vendors and say uh you know what is this really telling me and and of course uh 
folks like Tony are, are always there to uh, provide their, their level of experience and so forth. So on the fourth point here, uh, the solutions depend on criticality, health, operating history, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, typically small, healthy, or non-critical transformers may get something like a hydrogen monitor or hydrogen and moisture monitor only. Uh, usually uh, monitor when people start doing monitoring, the DGA monitor uh, is uh, the first thing they'll put on because looking at the 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 insulating fluid and when gases are generated in that fluid uh, is a good indicator just like a blood test on your uh, on yourself is good to get an understanding of how healthy you are uh, looking at the uh, gases in the transformer oil or the transformer fluid are very important and then of course as the criticality increases or you may uh, have unhealthy transformers on your system, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, of course, there are times when certainly you want to go to the multi-gas systems that you know do partial discharge and bushing monitoring and and so forth. Uh, and again, the vendors can provide a lot of recommendations on on what you should be putting on a particular transformer based on what bushings are in there and what type of low tap changer if it has one and so forth. So for our conclusions, I did a, a search for happy transformer and apparently there's a cartoon out there uh, named happy transformer. So uh, we all want to have happy transformers. And so uh, when, when uh, I went out to find uh, data on how long your transformer is going to last. It was very difficult to find uh, industry data on on that topic, and uh, I did. Uh, we did want to put this together and present the data that is available, so that people can uh, have a little bit better understanding. But uh, it all goes back to how good your crystal ball is, and everybody expects the the asset manager to have a crystal ball and be able to tell them. Well, when is this transformer going to fail, or is this a serious issue? Uh, and it's also important to note that uh, a lot of people are focused on transformer failures, but a lot of people, uh, for various reasons, you take out trans, tra you take transformers out of service for various reasons, uh, not just for failure. So they may be upgraded, they may be, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know. People are concerned about the age and so forth, but uh, again, from the data that, that we found, age isn't necessarily an indicator that, that you should be replacing your transformers. Uh, typical life expectation, you know, if you look at the, the data we have, uh, it looks like the uh, amount of transformers that are, uh, you know, you start after 20 to 30 years, you start seeing uh, less and less of those transformers. Uh, I saw a re recent article that uh, a certain class of transformers uh, utility was changing them out every 20 years. And in certain parts of the world, like Japan, uh, they, they are very, uh, at least in the past, have been very rigid about changing, certain changing out transformers after a 20 or 30 year life. And so uh, the concern, of course, is, uh, is the transformer you're putting in to replace it uh, going to last uh, as long as the the old transformer would have lasted if you would have left it in service. And so uh, I like to say that uh, your transformers will likely last a long time if they're designed well, manufactured well, maintained well, operated within recommended guidelines, again, minimizing through faults, uh, you know, and so forth. And, and I know Tony has some additional, additional things to say here. You're very prescient, sir. Yeah. Um, so first question is, what is a transformer? And the reason I ask that question is that we can maintain certain parts of it by just replacing them. Bushings, for example, if they deteriorate, we can put new bushings in. The cooling system, if it deteriorates, we put a new cooling system in. But the main windings, that's not something that we can replace easily. And our transformers are not commodity items. They're all different. They're all handmade chemical baths. And they're all subject to the problem of being a non-commodity item. But imagine you take it away from being transformed. You just look at your car. I always like the cars, so your Subaru. 
if the tires start to go down and start to show an evidence of a leak, that's going to be a problem that if you do not fix, you may have to replace the whole car. If the brakes are starting to fail, that's something you need to fix before you have to replace the whole car. So you've got to be thinking in terms of what can we do to maintain? And maintenance is just the management of deterioration. Maintenance is about checking, inspecting, gathering data to see if things are getting worse that I can fix. So where would we start with the age of the transformer? First of all, if it's a new transformer, did we specify it well? And the second thing would be, are we factory witness testing it and then checking it's being shipped correctly, installed correctly, uh, put in place? Little things can be bad. Um, we have had a transformer fail recently where they had undersized the leads from the bushings, uh, what's called the RV lead earlier, to the windings, and they were failing in service. This should have been picked up at the factory inspection. Well, let's look at the rest of the population. And for each of those, we need to treat them as an individual. For each transformer in our population that we're interested in, we have to collect data. We have to analyze the data and then see whether there is any failure mode in operation and then consequent to that how much life has been lost from the capability of the transformer monitoring allows you to update that more frequently monitoring allows you to detect both long-term failure modes and short-term failure modes i could discuss pushing failure modes um, ge type u's usually go bad over several weeks to months trench cot's trench coaters usually over a period of a few hours and we have cases where we can show that if you monitor sufficiently well, you can detect and avoid failures. And that includes for detection using DGA, such as hydrogen monitoring. So question is, on day one, I've got 100% of the life left of my transformer. And I would estimate for a good transformer, that would be 60 years. That should be what I would expect to be a minimum. And we then have to vary that depending on how we drove the transformer, what faults it's seen, what maintenance it's seen, what overheating it's had, um, whether it's been dried out, et cetera, et cetera. And that has to be added in. So to me, on day one, for a well-specified, well-built transformer, I want at least 60 years. And it's going to reduce from that depending on what I've done with it. Back to you, Leo. Okay. I think that's the uh, end of our presentation. Uh, are there any questions, Randy? Yeah, good. Uh, we we're um, we have several questions, so if we could get short answers, that would be uh, <laughs> that would be best. Yeah, regarding, no, uh, let let's see. Uh, regarding online monitoring, what are the what are the alarms and failures detected by you at present? Is there any statistics? Are there any statistics from? I can't. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of that. Are there any statistics for online monitoring of the faults and alarms detected? What type of faults and alarms are they? Okay, so there's about 16 hours of answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in general, uh, you know, again, depending on the criticality of the transformer, you're going to install monitoring uh, appropriate for, you know, it, for the criticality of the, the, the asset. And, and most of the time, the value of the transformer is very small compared to uh, the process or the revenue uh, at stake if you lose that transformer. And so uh, most utilities, large transformers are installed with uh, redundant systems so that if one fails, uh, others in the system can pick up the load. But as you move farther and farther down the the uh, to the distribution and so forth that uh, may or may not be the case. Uh, so again, uh, what's monitored and the alarm set points and so forth. Uh, if you're looking at a hydrogen monitor, you know, you uh, or, or bushing monitoring or or partial discharge monitoring, you know, that's where you look at the standards and you look at the the suppliers of the monitoring equipment for recommendations uh, on those alarm points. Anything else? Oh, to add? Great. Yeah, if I may, just sure. briefly, if you look at uh, IEEE C57 143, it'll tell you what you might want to monitor on different parts of a transformer, but it won't give you limits as to what you should set. And same reason why, same reason why we don't have common limits for tire pressures on a car. Different manufacturers' tires will have different limits. So you have to understand your own, excuse me, 
individual transformer application for bushing monitoring, for partial discharge monitoring, for temperature monitoring, for dissolved gases monitoring. And the data you generate from the monitor should help identify the most common failure modes. Um, other statistics for monitoring about faults and failures detected? Yeah, we can tell you about uh, trench bushings. We can tell you about GE type U's. We can tell you about Westinghouse 7 million transformers. We can tell you about um, Westinghouse O plus bushings. Lots of different bushings have individual failure modes. And detecting those is not difficult. There are some failure modes now we get with delaminations in resin fill bushings, which are a little bit more difficult. You have to add partial discharge to detect those. So the type of faults reflect the failure modes and the alarms should be there to give you enough time to do something, which we normally do. Uh, we do know people who use the monitoring just so they can say, yep, that one's going to fail and they let it fail. It depends what the transformer is and what the problem is. Right. It's also important to note, uh, Tony just talked a lot about bushings there. Uh, bushing, I love DGA, sorry. Uh, well, bushings are a, a, a common uh failure of transformers and it's important to note that when people monitor the oil or the fluid in the main tank uh mm -hmm. the bushing can fail regardless of what the oil in, in the main tank looks like so uh bushing monitoring is becoming more and more popular and for you know as as tony pointed out there's a lot of reasons for that uh one of the interesting things that we found at h2 scan is uh in china on 750 and 1000 kb bushings there's actually a tap where you can take an oil sample from the uh bushing itself and so uh china state grid has been installing sensor hydrogen and pressure sensors on those taps to monitor the the real time hydrogen if hydrogen is being generated and at what pressures uh the what the pressures are in the bushing so uh, again, depending on the equipment, most bushings don't have that capability. So, uh, you know, uh, you got to look at what your equipment is and and what's available, and and then understand, you know, where where you should be setting those alarms. Okay, great answer. Thank you very much for the presentation. We have to move on.